every day you live, you make some impact on the planet and you can choose what sort of impact you make. I went to the conference as a scientist. I left as an activist. I just knew I had to do something. For anyone watching who doesn't know you, and I can't believe there are any people watching who don't know you, can you just give us a brief overview of your journey from scientist to activist and what inspires you to campaign so passionately around climate and biodiversity? Okay, well, you know, there was a time before 1986, I thought I'd stay at Gombe National Park studying chimpanzees forever. They were the best days of my life. And then I realized at this conference uh, where we brought the chimpanzee people together, that chimpanzee numbers were dropping across Africa and forests were disappearing. So I went to the conference as a scientist, I left as an activist. I just knew I had to do something. Well, I didn't really know what to do, but went to Africa, learned about the problems facing the chimps, habitat destruction, hunting and so on. But I also learned about the problems faced by so many African people in poverty, with no good health, education, degraded land, moving into the forest. And I just knew that we had to find a way for these people to make a living without destroying the environment. We couldn't save anything. And has that worked? I mean, have we managed to give people a good life and also start to preserve biodiversity? Yes, it's um, honestly, it's amazing. This program started Take Care. We call it Takari. We just published a book about it. And it's a very holistic program, starting with choosing local people, not a group of arrogant white people going in and saying, this is what we're going to do to make your lives better. But local people, seven of them, who went into the villages and listened and asked them what they wanted. So it's a totally holistic program. And some of its main things, other than restoring fertility to the overused farmland without chemicals, um, is uh, microcredit based on Mohammed Yunus's Grameen Bank, and also uh, scholarships to keep girls in school. Um, because it's been shown all around the world that as women's education improves, family size drops, and you know the the births per woman when I first went to Gombe were eight to ten children per woman, and um, that's that's changing. So now in 104 villages throughout chimp um, chimp habitat in Tanzania, we've got this program. We've got it in seven other African countries around chimp habitat. And the people have understood protecting um, the environment isn't just for wildlife, it's for their own future. So they've become our partners in conservation. We still face enormous global challenges around climate and biodiversity. Why, why do you think a message of hope is so important in driving people to take action? Because I truly believe that we've got a window of time to, to make change, but it's closing. And if people lose hope, if you don't believe that what you're going to do is making a difference, why bother? So people tend to fall into apathy. They also look around at the problems of the world. You can't do that and not be depressed. And so I, I say, no, you can't save the world, but you can do something in your community. Get a group of people together, do what you care about, what you're passionate about. And so, so many people have told me that they promise now they'll do their bit that they had given up. So, you know, and also my biggest hope is in the youth. We've got our youth program, kindergarten through university, now in 69 countries and it's growing all the time. That would be the Roots and Shoots program. The Roots and Shoots program. Yeah. Could you just explain to us how that's working to educate and engage young people? Yeah, it started, <clears throat> it actually began in 91 with 12 high school students in Tanzania who were, you know, they were very upset about different things going on around them, the poaching, the illegal dynamite fishing, destroying the coral reefs, the street children sniffing glue with no homes, uh, terrible treatment of stray dogs, or the different things. So I said, well, get your friends together. And so we had a meeting of 30 young people and we decided the most important message was 
Every day you live, you make some impact on the planet, and you can choose what sort of impact you make. And because I learned in the rainforest how everything is interconnected, we decided every group would choose. They would choose a project to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. And so I think it's because they can choose. They then discuss, roll up their sleeves, and take action. Young people seem to have taken the initiative. They're really grasping the nettle that our current generation of leaders has refused to grasp. That's a wonderful thing. Yeah, it is indeed. And you know, my, I, I, I truly believe that people have to change from within. So you can yell at people, and you can point fingers, and you can blame them, and tell them to change, and. Most of them aren't going to listen. So for me, it's telling a story that reaches the heart. And I had a, a wonderful story from a CEO of a big international company、uh, when I was talking to a group of them, and he said, "Jane, I, I've been really working to get my my organisation、uh, more ethical in a country where we source in the supply line in my offices and the way we treat our customers." One. Seeing the writing on the wall that we're using up natural resources too fast, two consumer pressure. People are getting more aware, and they want to buy products that have been ethically produced. But he said, "What tipped the balance was my little girl of eight, and she came back from school one day, and she said, 'Daddy, they tell me that what you're doing is hurting the planet. That's not true, is it, Daddy? Because it's my planet.' That reached the heart." Stories are a really powerful way of reaching out to people and getting them to really understand what's going on. Now, we were talking about corporate responsibility, and I think you said that it is the responsibility of businesses to lead the way in the race to net zero. But how important is collaboration with, I guess, the the enemy to some extent? They are enemies in, in, in accelerating the, this change. Well, I think you know one of the most important things is collaboration and partnerships.、Um, people have been. Working on all these different problems, but so often in silos, and you know, so you may solve one problem, and if you're not looking at the big picture and working with others, then you may not realise you're causing problems somewhere else. Like, oh, we've closed down a coal mine. Great, all these CO2 emissions not going into the greenhouse gases. But if you're not looking at the whole picture, what about the people who lose their jobs? And if you had the big picture, there are people training those whose industries have closed into alternate、um, jobs. So you could have done both together. I recently had the privilege of seeing wild chimpanzees for the first time in Uganda, in Chambora Gorge in Uganda, and it was a moving experience for me. And I think that it's important for people to have contact with nature to really understand what we're doing to nature and what we stand to lose. Absolutely, and did you know that today is World Chimpanzee Day?、It's、I did not know that. Commemorates the very first day I set foot in Gombe National Park in 1960, and so we've made that day into World Chimpanzee Day. And there've been things all over, but yes, you've hit on a real problem: this disconnect between people and nature, especially in the big cities. And if you don't understand something. You know, you're not going to want to protect it. And virtual nature isn't the same as being out. And you just saw chimpanzees. You look in their eyes, and it's very moving. And you know, so we try in our roots and shoots and get little kids out into nature as often as we possibly can. So I spend a lot of time reporting on the various global crises that that we face, and it can sometimes be rather, as you said earlier, depressing. But you still manage to maintain an optimism that these are challenges that we can win. Well, we can win, but there's a big but. It's if we get together and take action quickly.、Um, you know, this is why I'll be 90 next year, but I still have to travel about 300 days a year. Which, okay, I have to fly, and that's bad for the environment. But I haven't been given a magic carpet yet, so <laughs> <laughs> and it、yeah. does make a difference being there in person. I do lots of zooming like this,、um, but. You know, we've got to wake people up, and if they lose hope, they're not going to do anything. So my recent book is the Book of Hope, and that has inspired many people to take action. 
That's a wonderful message. That's what today really is all about, is getting together, collaborating, using all the tools at our disposal to try and tackle these problems. Dr. Goodall, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us. You remain an inspiration to all of us. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to talk with me. And um, let's let's say what I say with roots and shoots, together we can save the world. Together we will, because we can, but will we? And then together we must. (laughs) 